Hello. Can you all hear me? Is this picking me up? Fantastic. I have to stand here for the reason that Hugh came to find me earlier and he said to me, Dean, I've got, we've got a bit of a problem. The lectern's probably a bit tall for you. <laughs> if, if I stand behind that, I will be fully obscured. So here I am. It's an absolute privilege to be here. I have to tell you that three years ago I spoke at a little workshop and I was sat in the front row there watching everybody else speak and thinking, I don't want to do a workshop, I want to be up there. And then three years later, here I am, and it's an absolute honour for me, it truly, truly is. Um, and today I'm going to share with you my experiences of Asperger's Syndrome. And I apologise now, it will be all positive, I'm afraid. There's no negative in there at all. I could stand here and talk about the negatives of my condition, it wouldn't do you any favours, it wouldn't do me any favours. For me, I think it's really important to focus on the positives, and because there are so many. And you read all the time about the negatives of Asperger's and autism. Forever, children get given diagnosis and it's always, this is what they can't do. They've got Asperger's, it means they can't do this, 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 this and this and this. And I'm forever saying, well, what about all the stuff they can do? Why aren't you focusing on that? And so today I'll be focusing on the stuff I can do because of my condition, the stuff I probably shouldn't do because of my condition, but still do. And that feeds into the most important part of my presentation. The word never has been attributed to me all of my life. Dean Beadle has got Asperger's Syndrome, he will never make friends. He will never cope socially, he will never go anywhere without his mother, he'll never get into his 20s without ending up in prison. I've got eight years to work on that one, but I don't think it's going to happen. So, never, 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 never. And I still say it to myself. Every single day I say to myself, I've got Asperger's Syndrome, it means I can't do this, this, this and this. And the prime example was about a year ago, I was quite a lot heavier than I am now. I'm not the tallest of men, I carry my weight all around the middle, and I was about two and a half stone heavier than I am now, and I thought, I'll not lose this weight on my own, I'll do a nice fitness column for the local paper, it'll have nothing to do with autism, it'll be a nice little side project, it'll be fun, and they said to me, what on earth are you going to write 700 words a fortnight on, Dean? And I said, I'll go to fitness classes. I'll go to a different fitness class every fortnight and I'll review it. And have you noticed that when people are offering you money, you often don't quite think about what you're actually agreeing to do in order to get the money? So I got the night before my first fitness class and I was stood there and I've never felt more on the autistic spectrum than that night. I thought, I've got to do this fitness class. I was disapplied from PE in year seven because I practically fainted before I went into the lessons. I can't do this. I'm on the autistic spectrum, I'll never be able to do it. But funnily enough, the pressure of being contractually obliged sort of made me. And so I looked down this list and thought, I'll pick the easiest one. I will pick the easiest fitness class on the list. So I looked down and got quite stressed about it. And doing these fitness classes are quite effective, actually, because I sweated for 12 hours before my first one. <laughs> so I'm looking down this list thinking, what's the easiest one? And I thought, that's the one. That's the one that will cause me less anxiety. Now, with hindsight, why I picked the one I picked baffles me. I picked line dancing. <laughs> now, the problem with line dancing is if you get it wrong, it's very clear because you end up facing somebody. <laughs> so, I arrive at this room, I'm the youngest person there by 50 years, I'm the only male, and I'm the only person in the room that doesn't have a grandchild. And I arrived, and I thought, I can't do this, I'm on the autistic spectrum, I've got paperwork at home that means I don't have to do this stuff, <laughs> why am I here? And so I'm stood in the middle of this room. The fitness instructors are trained to spot people like me. So she gets past me, locks me in before I can get back out again. And I'm stuck in this environment. It felt like I'd fallen into a loose women's studio. I was stuck in this room. Our European friends luckily don't know what loose women is, thankfully. You don't need to know, it's horrendous. Although, I must admit, I do quite enjoy it. Um, so I'm in the middle of this room. And I'm stuck, I'm thinking, I can't do this. My hand-eye coordination is terrible. I'll never be able to, to do this. This is going to be horrendous. I'm going to embarrass myself. And this little old lady came over to me, and she was about 70, and she said, I can see you're very nervous. And I said, yes, I am. I speak to hundreds of people a week at conferences. That doesn't make me as nervous as doing this in front of 11 of you. And thinking that she was helping, she said to me, don't be nervous. You can do this. I come here every week, and I've been coming for a year, and I still get it wrong. <laughs> yeah, thanks, love. That makes me feel so much better. So I'm, I'm stuck in the middle of this, I'm doing it, and I force myself through, and somehow I got half an hour into the lesson, I think it was sheer adrenaline, and I got through it, and I was stressed and sweating and anxious, and my anxiety levels were quite high, and I thought, I need to get out of this room. I was practically at the point of hyperventilating with anxiety. And I got halfway through, and I had a bit of an epiphany, a bit of a lights flash on moment. It was during Islands in the Stream by Dolly Parton and Kenny Rogers. <laughs> I'm doing the twirls and the finger clicks and the thigh slaps. I thought, hang on a minute, I'm doing this. I'm not any good at it. I am never coming here again, even if they double the fee, but I'm doing it. 
And I realised that as much as I'd worked myself up about it, I hadn't actually acknowledged the fact that I was getting through it. I was doing this, and I could do it. And I walked away thinking, do you know what? I still put limitations on myself just because I'm on the autistic spectrum. Every day. Another example, a friend of mine um, invited me to a party down in Brighton on the south coast. And he said to me, I'm having this party, Dean. It'll be wonderful. It'll be in a nightclub. It'll be people you've never met before. It'll be exciting. And then he said, but actually, it might make you a bit anxious, mightn't it, all these new people, this new place and the nightclub. So don't feel pressured to come, Dean. You don't have to come. Now, if he'd said to me, I'm just having this party, and I'd have gone, no thanks, it's, it's in a nightclub, I'll avoid that. But because he said to me, you're going to find this a bit anxious, I thought, I bloody well will go. <laughs> So I stomped down there, I took my closest friend with me, I expected that I would be the problem. I thought, I've got Asperger's syndrome, I will provide the difficulty this evening, I'll be the one that says the socially awkward things, I'll be the one that embarrasses myself, I'll be the one that gets hyperactive and misbehaves, it will be me. And I arrived at this place and slowly watched while all of my neurotypical friends got more and more drunk and outrageous. My, my closest friend decided to kiss everybody in the nightclub, then disappeared with a stranger. I was convinced he'd gone off with an axe murderer. So I'm, I'm texting him endlessly, saying, you know, where are you, what's happening? And also, there was that little bit of rationality in there that told me that I knew exactly what they were actually doing. And so I texted them also to try and interrupt them as much as possible. So texting away to him, pretty anxious about him, worried about his safety. On the other side, my friend who'd invited me down had decided to pick that Pacific evening to split up with his partner. So they're rowing. I'm supposed to be staying at his now ex-boyfriend's flat for the evening. I'm thinking breakfast is going to be fairly awkward. And I'm, I'm sat in the middle of all this, behaving really, really well. And I thought, hang on a minute. If that's what neurotypical is, they can keep it. <laughs> and for the first time ever, I thought, do you know what? Being on the autistic spectrum is a good place to be. <laughs> and that's what this presentation is about. So I'm going to discuss my life in some several key areas for you um, and discuss how it affects me, but it's going to be very positive. Now, the first is impulsions. I get urges to do socially inappropriate things every day. And I'm quite well known for talking about these things. And what I love is at the beginning of the presentation, when I talk about these weird things I do, everybody sits there and thinks, oh, he, he does that because he's on the spectrum. That's a very weird thing to do. Following socially inappropriate impulsions, he can't possibly. I want you to imagine what I'm going to share to you in this context, OK? So it's Monday morning. You've arrived at work. And you've just walked past your least favourite colleague. We've all got that person, haven't we? The person that makes our life that much harder. The person we get paid our wages to deal with. It's that person, right? And you've walked past them in the corridor. They go into a cupboard, they leave the keys in the lock, <laughs> and they're bent over picking up a box off the floor. All of you, every single one of you, would have the urge to give them a little kick and lock them in. All of you. And any of you that are denying it are lying. So you'd all have that urge, but most of you would say no to yourselves. That's the difference. My ability to say no to myself is very weak. It's, it's taken... In fact, I did lock my year two teacher in a cupboard, and she's only just recovered from it. So that's the difference. All of you have these urges. It's just that I'm far more likely to do it, and that's the problem. And it's, it's taken me 20 odd years to be able to stop myself from doing them. But every day, I still get massive urges to do things that are incredibly inappropriate. In the supermarket, I'm at my worst, because I'm really well behaved all week, and do my best to try and conform and blend in. And the other week, someone said to me, Dean, we'd never tell you on the spectrum unless you told us. We thought you were normal. And they thought that was a compliment. It was wildly insulting. I said, don't call me neurotypical, thank you. I've worked 20 years for my label. Don't take it away now. And in fact, my, my old catchphrase used to be, I can't say it anymore, I used to get disability living allowance. I don't get it anymore because apparently because I can leave the house without aid, I'm not autistic anymore, according to them. So I don't get any money from them anymore. But when I used to get it, my argument used to be, whenever I was being really badly behaved, mum would say, why are you being so difficult? And I used to say, mum, I don't want to behave like this. You don't want me to behave like this. But the government are paying me £250 a month to behave like this. I want to be good value for money. And it really upsets me that I can't use that catchphrase anymore. I'm having to think of a whole new one. So I get these urges every day, and in the supermarket is when it comes to the surface, because I behave so well every week, I allow myself one hour on a Saturday to be a child. And this is my key, first key point to you, ladies and gentlemen, and this is to the neurotypical people out there too. Give yourselves at least one hour a week of being a child. It's the most fun you can have. Take your most conservative friend to the supermarket and run riot for an hour. It's incredible. So I take my mum along. If, imagine when I'm telling you this, the Benny Hill theme tune in the background. Because that's exactly what it's like. 
So we're walking down the aisles, mum will put in stuff into the trolley that she wants, I'll wait until she turns round, I'll take it back out and put it back on the shelf again. Or I'll put stuff in that she doesn't want in large quantities, wait till she gets just before the checkout, when it's a significant journey to put it all back again, and then I'll say, mum, six chickens, really? And the look on her face keeps me entertained for days. If we're in a big supermarket, I'll run off with the trolley. And I tell you, I'm 22, my mum is 48, she chases me. <laughs> and the looks we get, I haven't had those looks in 15 years. And anyone that's worked in autism, anyone that lives with it, anyone that has a child with it, knows that look. The look you get from parents that you know would not cope with those children anyway, if, it were, if they were theirs. They give that look of, what's he doing in the wider community? Why can't his mother control him? Why is he not sectioned? What a terrible parent. My mum never gets those looks anymore. In the supermarket, when I'm running off with the trolley, she gets those looks regularly. And I have to tell you, it's such a buzz for me. Because I, I walk out the supermarket feeling a little bit smug, thinking, you've still got it, kid. Never left you. 